Are we on? Yeah, we are. Good morning, Harris Chapel. Oh, it is so great to see all of your faces this morning, and we are excited that you chose to worship with us, so welcome. I have several announcements for us this morning, so bear with me. Uh, it's a big week here in the life of the church, so we are gearing up for Old Fashioned Day, obviously, which I'll go ahead and pass around these clipboards now if you want to sign up. We've got a great group of helpers, but you know what I've learned is you can never have enough. So if you are available, we would love to have your help for Old Fashioned Day. And speaking of help, I am still signed up to help with a water station down the road here this Saturday for the Ironman race. And if you weren't here last week and you didn't hear my funny story about how I got a splash Coke in a guy's face, I'll tell you after church, okay? So you can come and splash Coke in a guy's face with me all day Saturday if you want, all right? We'll have a good time. It's a fundraiser for our missions trip next year. Uh, that's what all the funds will be going to. So if you think you can help Saturday, please let me know. And then we'll also have a crew cleaning up Sunday uh, down at the beach, only about 40 minutes. I know it's old-fashioned day, so we'll work that in uh, time-wise there. Also wanted to give an exciting announcement. Dave Lambert, Dave, can you wave for us so everybody can see you? Or stand up, there you go. Dave has stepped up to be our Sunday school superintendent, and so we are just so thankful for that. Yes, we are so, so thankful for that, and so uh, we'll be getting him into the swing of all that and uh, just continue to pray for him as he leads those efforts as well. Uh, my last announcement is you, you'll see the flyers there on your way out about the ladies' retreat and the Ark Encounter and stuff like that. We do have a video this morning uh, that we're going to play just as a reminder for all the ladies coming for that. Hello, I am Chelsea DeMattis, and I am so excited to come back to Muncie, Indiana and speak with you at Harris Chapel. It was such a joy last year, and it's going to be a joy yet again to dive into the Word of God together. We are going to be talking all about traveling with Jesus and what that looks like through the Great Commission, what that looks like in bearing good fruit wherever God has us, and what it looks like to be in godly relationships with women and people that point us to Christ and how we in turn can also point them back to the heart of God. I can't wait to see you again October 21st at 9.30 a.m. It is going to be a blessed time. Awesome, awesome. Thank you. So ladies, make sure you, you see either Chris or Jill uh, about that. It's going to be, or Jane, it's going to be an awesome, awesome time, October 21st. Now, if you would stand, find somebody you don't know, greet, your, greet them and welcome them. Continue standing as we begin a time of worship with how great is our God. 
The splendour of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. Yeah. 
Oh, yeah, oh, yeah sorry. sorry. I thought we'd lost, lost to a verse. Let's sing the last uh, verse. By the crystal river flowing. By the crystal flowing river With the ransom I will see And forever and forever Praise and glorify the King All that thrills my soul is Jesus He is more than life to Lift up your holy name, Lord. You are so worthy of our praise. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, and is to come, Lord. Father, we just thank you for those of us that could gather here this morning, Lord, in your house, and worship in spirit and truth with the body of Christ. We just pray, Lord, for those who could not make it through illness or sickness or whatever's going on in their life, Lord. We just pray for your healing hand upon those in our community that are sick and ill, Lord. We pray that you'll be them with them. We ask these things in Jesus' wonderful and powerful and mighty name, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Thank you all. The, you may be seated. And the kids are dismissed. All right. You all are in for a great blessing here in just a few minutes but at this time we want to ask the ushers to come if they would please yeah i hope that a lot of our youth can be in on this as well as all of you because uh, i'm just thrilled about what we're going to see here in just a few minutes i do have um after the ushers go by I'm going to borrow David and Lona and Greg and Sherry because I have flyers for next Sunday. And I share that because of today and next Sunday is Old Fashioned Day, which is a huge event in the life of the church. I invite you not only to come, but I invite you to bring all your friends. Do your friends have old cars? Do your friends have old tractors? Join us next Sunday. It's a huge event. We don't have Sunday school because everything's all set up for the worship. The church will be with us, and we've had them before. Have y'all heard the church before? Anybody remember the church? Yeah, last time they were here, they were out on a flat big wagon out here, and another time, they, a couple times they've been in here. I talked to Keith Clark the other day, and, and uh, I'll tell you what, he just talks like he is from Carolinas or West Virginia. I don't know, but, but Keith and the guys have such a heart for Jesus and a heart for good gospel bluegrass music. That's my Sunday where I get to tea, you know, they call it the knee slapping, toe tapping, hand clapping music. And uh, some people would rather scratch a chalkboard than listen to it, but I just, I just rejoice and relax and enjoy. So join us next Sunday. I'm gonna, these four folks I just picked on a minute ago, we've got flyers to give to everybody. I wanna make sure all the flyers disappear. Take them wherever you go. I've shared it on my Facebook. Grab mine, share it on your Facebook. Let's get the word out about Old Fashioned Day. 
Jesus, thank you now that we can bring in tithe and offering. Thank you for the gift. Thank you for the gift. But we know, Lord, that this is one of those things that in our world where things are up and down, stock market, housing values, car values, all other kinds of things at the store and the gas pump, all that stuff is all over the map. Thing. This is one thing, Lord, that we invest with with our lives. And Lord, it multiplies like nothing else. And we're going to hear about it multiplying here in just a little bit. But Jesus, use this gift, use this offering to touch hearts and lives, and may your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Thank you, gentlemen. Still can't play flute, so you're going to have to suffer through my piano playing. I'm going to be playing a very simple children's song. You all know, Jesus Loves Me. And it speaks a couple messages to me. It is that no matter what we do, we can't do anything that can make Jesus love us any less. He went all the way to the cross for us. And he not only has forgiven our sins, but we hear in Hebrews 8.12 and Hebrews 10.17 that he doesn't even remember them anymore. And the second message is this particular arrangement I'm going to try to play. Um, because the arranger, Fred Bach, has based it on French impressionistic composer Claude Debussy's Claire de Lune. Claire de Lune means light of the moon or moonlight. And we know that the moon doesn't produce its own light. It reflects the light of the sun. And this particular arrangement reminds me that we're to be like the moon and reflect the light of the true Son of God, who is Jesus Christ. And that, that light is love, and we're to reflect that into a world of darkness. So Jesus loves me, a la Claude Debussy's Claire de Lune.
Amen. Amen. Um, let's see, is Gary, where's Gary at? Springer, Gary Springer out there? Great, Gary Springer and Paul Shaver, if I can borrow both of you gentlemen. I've got some sheets here, and there's some more out back. If you've not picked up these yet, we're going to hand these out. We're not going to walk through this, but it's going to be the starting point for what I want to talk with you about this morning. Deb does a great job, and by the way, thank you, Renee, and thank you, Deb, both. Great worship. They do a great job. There's some out in the foyer, too, so on the table. But um, something that happened in our church, not our church locally, but as a denomination over the last probably 10 years or so, the work of the church has grown exponentially around the world, not as much here in the USA and Canada. Uh, we've been on the decline in the USA and Canada. Back in 1997, I saw where the graph crossed to where there were more people that were part of the church in the Nazarene in other parts of the world than there are here in the USA and Canada. Now that percentage is about 75 to 80% who are part of the church in the Nazarene outside the USA and Canada. There are more that are part of the Nazarene church in Africa than there are in the USA and Canada. Some people say, well, Jim, there's more people that live in Africa. Well, you need to understand, we're not even in half of Africa. We're, we're not even, there's so many major parts on the northern half of that continent we haven't even touched. So, so when I say we're in these countries, it may be in this area or that area, but not the entire continent. Yet, we have all this activity happening. It seems like over these last several years, there's, there's been less, and Eva was our missionary president for years, and others have served in that capacity. It seems like there's less and less information out, no more missionary books coming out and missionary lessons, monthly lessons, and, and Ilona's been part of that as well, leading our effort with great lessons, great material, but it just, so I'm like, this is really concerning to me because we're literally going around the world. Well, this movie came out recently, uh, Sound of Freedom. Have y'all, anybody been to see Sound of Freedom? Okay, if you haven't seen it, well, I don't know if it's still around or not, it will be online if it's not already online. It is worth it because it talks about one of the biggest travesties happening on the planet, and that is human trafficking. There are more people in slavery today than at any other time in our world's history. People will look at the 1800s and talk about that period of time, tragic. Overall, though, there are many, many more people in slavery today than ever. Slavery has been around since, uh, I can't even think back through the Old Testament, you know, history, all through history. But it got me talking one day in Sunday school, and I realized that we have a couple in our church who have actually been part of a ministry in Bogota, Colombia. And then in talking with them further, it made me realize that we're really blessed. Um, and we've had mission trips that many of you have been on. This is a couple who's been in real-time missions and still is now. And I wanted to bring them and interview them. And before they come, I want you to make sure you have that sheet handy because we're also walking through the Blackaby study. And if you've not been a part of experiencing God, you're missing out on probably one of the biggest blessings I've ever been a part of in my whole ministry. And that is this idea of God moving, not just to touch people spiritually, but to move people, to move people. And what I'm seeing here, if you look at this sheet, it talks about how he moved Noah, Abraham, Moses, David. You see the bullet points, Ruth, Jonah, Elisha, the apostles, Mary, Paul, and then also his main points. And one of the main points about two-thirds of the way down that first page is we can't stay where we are and go with God. Mm -hmm. I want to invite up um, if Dwayne and Renee would just come on up and join me this morning. And I don't know if these microphones are not on or not, but... I've been spending some time with them, and I was over at their house yesterday, and that one has a little bit of juice left in it. This one's fully charged, so they may just share it between the two of them. But uh, I want to tell you about this couple, and I'll let them talk as well, of course, because that's why they're up here. Um, they met at a place called God's Bible College over in the Cincinnati area. I remember years ago, God's Bible College brought their orchestra, which was too big for this platform, and we had it at Wapahani, we honored Merv Barnard. And some of you remember that, we honored Merv Barnard with the Distinguished Service Award, and they just were so wonderful. The kids, the instructors who were part of that great event. But now we've, we've kind of, lightning has struck twice as we've come to know this couple. And uh, uh, I'll let them tell you a little bit about their story, how they met, 
and where they started ministry. So Dwayne, you want to speak, or Renee, however you want to do this. So, okay. I don't get to speak at home, so this is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. I started that out wrong, didn't I? Yeah. Um, no, uh, I'm from, I, I grew up in uh, Michigan, uh, just north of Grand Rapids area, 25 miles in from Lake Michigan, and uh, grew up in a great home, and uh, went to God's Bible School when I was, uh, uh, for my college years. Um, three years later, Renee came, and she grew up in Illinois, uh, out in the midst of cornfields, south of Champaign-Urbana, and um, I was dating at the time, not her, um, and, uh, but I noticed her, so I don't know what that says about me or her, but anyway, uh, anyway, uh, as time passed by, we uh, started dating and got married 31 years ago, ah, got that right, and uh, so I think it's going my way today, um, but uh, we uh, left, after we were married, we were living in Cincinnati, finishing up schooling. Uh, we went to move back to Michigan, um, and I taught at the school that I had attended growing up for one year. Uh, that very first year in February, in the middle of a Michigan winter, uh, my brother-in-law called me, who was married to Renee's twin, and he was teaching school in the Cayman Islands. And he said, hey, you ever consider teaching in the Cayman Islands? In the winter. Well, it's February in Michigan. <laughs> you know, I hadn't really thought about it, but it sounded pretty good. So uh, that's kind of where I wish uh, I told Pastor Jim yesterday, I wish I could say that this was a real spiritual moment for me where I sought God for hours and felt clear. It really wasn't that way. I feel like I was a Christian walking in the spirit, I, everything. Um, but it was just like, you know, we're young. We'll never probably have this opportunity again. Let's. You know, we have to sign a three-year contract. We can do anything for three years, particularly if there's a beach like that within walking distance. So anyway, um, it uh, we ended up staying 12 years there. So that's the beginning. And so the school there was kind of a, you say there were a lot of Christian schools because there were a lot of kids and the government didn't have enough schooling in place. So they were at a Christian school and both of you have music degrees. But, uh, but the, I think the thing that, one of the first things that got me was, it wasn't just teaching classes, they were molding and shaping the lives of kids. And so you said you were there for 12 years, but the Cayman Islands, or as Dwayne a lot of times would say Cayman, or Cayman, and down in Cayman they say Cayman, but it's Cayman Islands. Um, they didn't just stay there, and this is what intrigued me, because when I mentioned that movie, uh, Sound of Freedom, he said, oh yeah, I, I've, I've been to Columbia. And it wasn't like some casual journey. So, so if you want to tell us what year this started, and, and we'll kind of connect all the dots, because it wasn't just Cayman Islands, it was also Columbia, so maybe tell us about how you got there and what you did there. Yeah, so uh, after we moved to Cayman, I met uh, one of the parents of the students that I taught um, was from Columbia and had moved to uh, Cayman years before, uh, got married, and was raising his family there but had a real heart for Columbia and uh, all the problems there. He was in the military uh, actually six weeks before he was to get out. It was compulsory there, just uh, kind of like Israel, all young men serve in the military unless they're rich and their parents pay their way out of it. Um, there's that option, sorry. <laughs> That's the way it is. Um, anyway, he six weeks before, he just left. He just went AWOL. He couldn't take it anymore. Um, they caught him, and so he got three more years in a prison uh, in Columbia, which is, if he, that's not like our prisons. And um, so anyway, he was saved as a result of all that uh, move to Cayman and everything, got saved, and then really had a heart for Columbia. So he, we, we talked for two or three years, like, yeah, we need to go to Columbia sometime. We, we should go over there and do something. We need to figure out something. But it's just talk, you know. Then it was like, man, wouldn't it be cool if we started a satellite school over there? But again, we're just talking like out the top of our head. There's not like this major plan behind this or anything. We didn't have any great uh, business plan worked out or anything. It was just like, hey, that'd be cool. Wouldn't that be neat if we had a school over there? So one year we finally decided, hey, 
we're going over in February, and we're just going to see what we can do. We're, we didn't really go to start a school. We just went to see what we could figure out. And we took several of our students with us. And um, in that one week that we were in Columbia, we got a place to have a school. We got two teachers lined up. We got a curriculum figured out. This is in a week. We walked away from that trip thinking, boy, that wasn't us. That was something a whole lot bigger than us. Uh, 20 years later, 21 years later, that school's still there. I can show you pictures of the kids. Um, they're reaching out to what are, uh, in English, would be called the displaced ones. It's Colombians from the uh, jungles, from the inner parts of Colombia, the very primitive, remote areas that have fled to cities uh, to escape the guerrillas and the warfare that's happening as a result of the cocaine uh, trade that happens that, uh, that America supports so readily. Um, a lot of what you saw in the um, in that movie, if you've watched that movie, um, which that's dramatized and everything, but that's real. That's uh, I haven't been to the jungle part. Okay, <laughs> I'm, I'm not the guy from Sound of Freedom. Uh, uh, but um, but the cities look just like that. That's exactly. I mean that that was filmed on location. That's that's what it looks like. That's what it is. But yeah, so God just did amazing things. Uh, I ended up, uh, Renee and I both went the first couple trips. I went back a couple more times after we moved back to the States um, just to see what, and, and you know, God always takes what you do and multiplies it. And like I said, it, it wasn't like any great plan on our part or we were all organized and got our act together and perfect and all this stuff. None, none of that, none of that. I think it was just being willing to walk through it, to, just to walk out God just takes it and multiplies it. It's amazing. Wonderful. So you went there, what, five, six, how many times did you say? I, I've been there four times. Four times, yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. Renee was there a couple of times. Mm -hmm. And in, in the movie, and this is another connecting point, you, you said that they pretty much live hand to mouth, day to day, and, and maybe talk about that dynamic about parents and kids and stuff, and why yeah. it's not surprising what we saw in the movie. Yeah, so I think sometimes we look on, as Americans, we can look on at that movie and say, how could a parent allow their kid? How could they believe that that is actually gonna be a thing, that they're gonna have a way out? If you go to those countries, you suddenly realize that they live their entire lives with the thought that we need to make enough money to buy enough food to eat today. That's their life. Like, it's not a game, it's not this thing like, hey, someday I'm gonna retire, we're gonna kick back, we're gonna move to Cartagena, lay on the beach. Do There's none of that. There's none of that. Their whole mindset is, this is life. We're, we're gonna go out, we're gonna stand, put a little stand on the corner, we're gonna sell these little snacks for just pennies pennies. If they work and make enough all day long, they'll have enough. They can feed their family. Then they can get up tomorrow morning and do the same thing again. There's a sense of resignation and hopelessness in that life that just, and then all of a sudden there's this thing, hey, your child could possibly get out of this. I can see parents hope beyond hope. I, somehow I can help my child get out of this hopelessness. And then the rest of that happens. It's just such a difference, it's such a, there's such a cultural difference between a third world environment and what we know, even as what we would say is poor in America or destitute is not really poor and destitute because there are so many things, there are so many places to catch where people could fall through the cracks that just doesn't happen in those other countries. I don't know if that answers your question. I just wanted us to think about that. So you, you planted some schools. Did you also do some, uh, did you work with any pastors, churches, discipleship training? I mean, was it basically school, both music majors, was it basically music and school or were there other avenues of discipleship and training and such? Yeah, the majority of everything we've been involved in has been school and music related. Um, a little bit of the other, but not near as much. 22 million people, they told me, that are in, in uh, Bogota. So that was uh, 2003. But before then, you started another connection in a place called Guadalajara. So tell us about that. Yeah, so in 2000, 
Again, um, I, I should preface all this by saying when I was a kid, the church that I went to was very, very heavily involved in missions. This is kind of probably where some of this desire came from. Um, and they, um, they ha we supported a work in Haiti, and every other year, they took a group of men, mostly. Some ladies would go, but it was a very primitive country, but you had to be at least 13 years old to go. So the year I turned 12 in April, my family, uh, the uh, church went to, uh, the following February, they went to Haiti, and I begged to go, I was still 12. Finally, just said no. You got to be 13 to go. If we make an exception, you know, I'll, I'll bring. Well, the year I turned 13, there was civil war in Haiti. <laughs> I never went to Haiti. Uh, they stopped going to Haiti because it was too dangerous. Um, so there was all that. So that inside me is this like I got gypped thing. You know, I I got ripped off as a teenager because everyone, all my brothers, I'm one of seven. All my brothers and sisters went to Haiti. And I didn't go to Haiti, so you feel sorry for me yet? I'm just, that's really what I'm trying to sell here. It's just a little bit of, you know, you need to feel sorry for me because I'm just ripped off. So anyway, that, that was kind of the whole thing is like I was constantly looking and then started living in Cayman and then started thinking, oh, man, I want to do a mission trip because Cayman did not feel like the mission field. You know, <laughs> it's a beautiful place. And it's like, this can't be the mission field yet. So um, and all I'd ever seen was pictures of Haiti, so it's got to be better. But um, in late 1998-99, my brother and I started talking because of a contact he had in Guadalajara. Uh, they, were, they really wanted us to come and just help them start a music program in their school. Just come for a week, invest in the week, and then they're going to try to keep it going. We're going to go back and help them. So we went in 2000. And um, so every year from 2000 to 2000, uh, 2019, uh, they had that uh, week or two in the summer where they just did a concentrated thing, and we made it to all, almost all of them. I think we missed 2002, 2004, something like that. But other than that, we've gone pretty much consistently. They decided to stop the uh, that that music camp as it was in 2020 was supposed to be the last one in the summer of 2020. And you all remember we had some things happen in 2020 that caused a lot of things to go haywire, so we didn't even do that camp. But the, uh, the pastors of the church where that hosted the event, they had talked to me about coming and just teaching in their school, uh, you know, at least one time a year, maybe a couple times a year, see if that would work out. So in January of 2020, right before the pandemic, I actually went down and talked in their school for a week. And then not again until late 2022. But we go we usually go April and November-ish uh, each year and uh, spend uh, 10 days to two weeks down there, something like that. And so a couple things about Guadalajara. Uh, the connection was a lady from, not from Guadalajara. Where was she from? Right. So there was a, uh, my oldest brother, the way we got connected there, my oldest brother went to college with um, one of the ladies that was church. She, when she graduated from God's Bible College, she felt like God wanted her to go to Mexico. She didn't know where. So she just, and I can't remember the name of the city where she went, but she went to a city because she heard that they had an orphanage there and that she thought she could maybe start there and do that. When she got there, within a very few weeks, before she even really made connections at the orphanage, she met a lady who had come from Japan. In who, Guadalajara, Mexico, in Gua in, from in, Japan. Okay. Yes, so they're in Mexico, and they meet. This lady said, God told me to go to Mexico. So she went to Mexico, to the same town, to do something totally different, but they met, connected. They ended up moving to Guadalajara um, to work among a large Asian community because Guadalajara is a manufacturing center, and many people from uh, Korea and another country, I, I forgot it yesterday, I should have looked it up. But there's two uh, main groups that, there's large numbers of them that live in Guadalajara, they have emigrated there. It's because the people got posted there from their from the manufacturing plants in, uh, in Korea and other places. Uh, but they, the wives there were usually from a little uh, 
upper echelon of society in their country, so they were not the cooks and stuff at the, when they were home, but when they got to Mexico, they were supposed to do that. So these ladies didn't know how to cook or sew or anything, so they, these two other ladies in the palm, they, they thought, this is our opportunity. We'll teach these people to cook and sew. Then we'll share the gospel with them. So they built an entire church in Guadalajara off of teaching uh, Asian ladies how to cook and sew <laughs> and leading them to Christ. And I see to me that's the, that's the great thing about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God we put into a little box. We call it church. And we think this is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is dynamic. The kingdom of God is wherever you're doing work and connecting people to the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is in you. The kingdom of God is around you. It's an amazing thing. And uh, so that was the connection there with those two ladies. Um, and they, out of that, they started the school. This is the school we went to. Um, a great story about the lady from Japan. The Kalmans, uh, Charles and Letty Kalman, were from, they were at GBS, but she wrote the devotional Streams in the Desert. If anyone's ever read that, use that devotional, Streams in the Desert. They, they, they were teachers at God's Bible School in the early 1900s. They left there, went to China, started the Oriental Mission Society. Out of that flowed into, yeah, OMS. Out of that flowed into Japan, the work in Japan. There was a boy in Japan that got into that ministry, went to God's Bible School as a student in the 30s, and was called to go back to his, uh, uh, his country and try to... Uh, Japan is like 98% Buddhist. Uh, one of these converts was the lady in Guadalajara. Uh, she, was, she was led to the Lord through this guy's ministry. She goes to Guadalajara. Um, while she's there, she always goes back to Japan and, and, and meets with those people. And one of those trips, she meets a young man who is not a believer, who is Buddhist background, um, but not practicing. That's just his family's background. He's just pretty much, he doesn't believe in anything, whatever. He finds out she lives in Mexico. He just wants to get to Mexico. He doesn't really care what, how, how to get there. She just took that as a ministry opportunity. She says, yeah, she could come over and help around. You know, we need people to help around the place. And he comes over, he gets saved. He comes back to GBS as a student and um, is now living in Canada, I think. So, Sometimes you trace those paths of how God just works through the generations. That's an amazing thing as well. But, yeah, I, I don't know if I've, I've rambled like that's, crazy. No, sorry. no, no, that's, none of that is rambling. <laughs> Her mic is, is it dead now? That's all right. Okay. It just, it amazes me. It's kind of a fun side note. When he talks about going to teach, these are like K through 8 and a lot of times the students are 10 years old or so, nine maybe some, but 10, and you'll have how many, and, and you're just kind of, you're just kind of just starting. I mean, you're just kind of going for it. And, and how many will you have, and, and in a week, what are you doing? So use, um, usually around 50 to 60 kids is what I'll work with in a week. Um, last year, I was telling Pastor Jim yesterday, um, you, you always have some years that are special challenges. So last year, they, uh, one of the beginning groups was eight clarinetists. I'm a brass player, but I've, I've taught wind, all wind instruments, but there, were, there was eight clarinetists. Every one of them was boys. They were all wired to 220. They didn't speak a lick of English. Uh, yeah, I, that was maybe the challenge of my life, and I just finally realized that if I didn't, if I wasn't talking or having them do the next thing, they would fill the space. Uh, and that, yeah, that was, um, I, that 45 minutes every day was exhausting. Um, you had to kind of like brace yourself at the beginning and then go full bore. But that, that was the most interesting one. Uh, but yeah, there's, it's all wind instruments. We work with them um, from about 8 in the morning till 3-ish, 2.30, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Pretty much straight through. Um, and uh, they just keep sending them to me. So I try to teach them something. I know we're, we're going to hit one more country, but uh, I guess one of the questions I asked you yesterday was, was in these countries, you you were free to share the gospel. 
Oh, yes. What was that like? How, yeah. how, did, how did they encourage that and maybe others that were involved in that as well? Yeah, so everywhere I've been, I was telling him yesterday, everywhere I've been, I've never, I've never since, it's never been a place hostile to uh, the gospel. Um, a lot of skepticism at times. Uh, a lot of the countries we go to are very heavily uh, high percentage of Roman Catholic. And then in, in Mexico, there's this mixture of uh, Roman Catholicism mixed with like um, ancient Inca, Aztec religion. So they got this real strange um, thing going on. Yeah, you, don't, you don't really know where church starts and it stops. It's kind of all weird. But, um, but as far as sharing the gospel or, or anything like that, there's no, there's no pushback on that. And, yeah, and, very, and most of the time, very open to the gospel. It's, it's, not, it's not hard to get people to listen to the gospel in those settings. And you found that even the government would help support these Christian private schools, right? Yes, yeah. So even in, the K, in, in Cayman, it was that way. The government was very supportive of the, of the Christian schools. Um, in the other countries, they are as well, because most of, those school, most of those places want their children to be educated. They understand the value of that, but they do not have the infrastructure to get it done. They just don't have enough schools or teachers or anything to do it. So any group that comes in, this always, this, it's always, I, I always feel like this is a challenge for the Christian church because it's our responsibility to get there. And too often the people that are getting there are people who really are teaching falsehoods to these kids. You know, that in the vacuum of Christianity, other religions will move in and teach and take over another generation. So these places that are open, uh, it's really up to Christians to get there. Before we go to the other country, maybe you want to tell about your journey in Bogota where you didn't realize you were in danger until you got back to town. <laughs> so I told him, uh, we, we were talking something about, did you, have you ever felt threatened in these countries? Because some of the countries have a scary reputation. And, um, I'm not, uh, I, I am blessed with a very low perception of what's going on around me. <laughs> so, my uh, God gave me a wife who has a very heightened awareness of what's going on around me, so that kind of balances it out a little bit for me, but um, I could probably get in trouble. I, I, I almost did one year. Uh, it was, it, my wife was not with me. So, in, in Bogota, these displaced people that come in, they live on the very outskirts of the city. So Bogota is this huge valley with mountains all the way around. It's very beautiful. It's very high up in altitude, so it's never very warm there. Um, a lot of times when we've been there, it's maybe getting up to 50 during the day, kind of rainy, overcast, just kind of chilly, you know. Um, more so if you lived in Cayman and then went there. But, uh, but so on the top of these mountains, they just kind of move in and they, what we would call be squatters on the land, just build a little hut to live in. And these huts are literally four posts with like corrugated metal roofing material around the walls and a little slot dirt floor on the bottom. Very, very poor. But that's kind of a lot of the place we did our ministry. And they just recommend, they just told us, hey, get off the mountain before dark. Get back into the city. Don't be up here after dark. Because the gorillas sometimes, those people would be coming in not to do anything other than whatever, but they, they were just coming in from the jungle areas, and if, if they saw white people, uh, they, they always assume you're very wealthy and that you'll bring money as ransom, so they want you off the mountain. So we have, like I said, never felt threatened, never anything, so the last trip I was there, my friend who's from Columbia and I were up there, we were finishing the day, and it was early, we got done early which almost never happens on a mission field. Usually you plan at getting done at five, it's like 10 o'clock at night, you're finishing up. So, but we plan to get done about five. We're, it was like 1.30, 2 o'clock, we're done, ready to leave. And I'm just standing there, of course, you're at the very edge of the city looking out, and it's just gorgeous. And there's this road running through there. I said, man, that is so beautiful, I love it. He goes, we're gonna go that way. We're gonna go down that road, and we can go up around that, that hill right there, and we can come back in on the opposite side of town, but we'll just, we got the time, let's do it. Let's go. So we noticed, we stopped, took pictures, 
We noticed these guys standing at the top of the hill. We waved at a few of them. You know, got to be friendly. So, <laughs> so we noticed, the one time I noticed, I thought, that guy's got a rifle. That's kind of weird. So I said, is that a rifle? And, he's, and he said, yeah, that's a rifle. They must be military or something. He said, uh -huh. so we went on our way, finished it off. So that night we're at supper. My friend Helmer's talking to his brothers who live there still. And he's explaining, he's, and the guy said, where did you take him? And he told me, he goes, you're crazy. That's a gorilla stronghold. Those were gorillas. That, the only people out there is gorillas. There's, he said, we don't even go out there. But we had a great time waving at them. So I don't think it's ever as dangerous as you think it is. Either that or maybe there was a, you know, I like to think, uh, you read Old Testament and like where Ge Gehazi and Elisha said, hey, there's, he said, don't worry about it. Just lift your eyes above the enemy. You see all those chariots and everything around there? That's the angel. Of the, so I think maybe the, there's maybe a few chariots behind us that day or something. I don't know. Although I don't know that God's real interested in protecting our foolishness. <laughs> That's, that sounds almost like a sermon. God yes. does not want to protect your foolishness. Um, one more thing, and well, a couple more things, but you talked about never getting to Haiti, but you did get to Haiti. And I think this is one of, well, all this was so good for me to hear, but, but to tie this together and the fact you took students, if you'll tell us about that trip and what that meant for the yeah. Cayman students and such. So like I uh, talked about earlier, I always had this desire to go to Haiti because all of my siblings, I'd seen pictures forever growing up. And uh, so there came an opportunity in 2002, 2003, right in that time, to go to Haiti to the work where uh, it was now the son of the, the person that was a pastor when my parents were going there and everything, but his son was now the pastor of the church. They had a, they had a school there and everything. And there came an opportunity to take a group of students over to, over to Haiti. And um, that was a, a real life changing. And I think the, uh, what he was referencing is, is that um, we were talking about it, but uh, Cayman is a very affluent place. There are people that are poor there, but by and large, the students you work with will be very affluent. There'll be a lot of money. Whether So there's a, uh, in the last, the years that we were there, there was becoming this rising sense of entitlement among those students. And you could just really see the love of money taking over a culture. It's like you could see it in real time. And so this became one of the things is like, got to get them out of Cayman because that's all they know and I know there's people here Alon, and they, they go to Cayman quite often and it's, it's a beautiful place but it's also a very small place they'll tell, you, they'll tell you it doesn't take long to get around the island unless there's traffic which there's most of the time but it's 20 miles long it's not you know a mile wide in a lot of places a tiny island so we our thought was man we've got to get them out and see and so I thought you know this would be an, a real opportunity to take them there. So we took them to Haiti. Uh, getting from uh, getting out of Port-au-Prince is uh, Renee is still a little bit traumatized by that trip. Um, it, 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 it really the reason I'm traumatized <laughs> is because they told us when you're in the airport, keep your eye on your luggage. So they have all these locals that come in and try to take your luggage, you know, for money. Well, you know. Car, you your car. We get, we land. Okay, so we have kids from a different culture with us. So we are responsible, just the two of us. And we had what, six, nine, nine kids. And um, so we get off the plane, we get there, and I'm just freaking out, you know, like trying to keep everybody together. And he goes, meets the pastor, and they just start walking. And all the kids follow. And I'm, I'm like, well, I've got to be at the back here to make sure everybody gets their stuff. Like, people are grabbing it. They're just all of them are oblivious. And I'm back here just like, no, 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 no. <laughs> Anyways, that's why I'm traumatized. <laughs> like I said, I have a very low awareness of what's going on around me. She has a very heightened awareness, so yes, so that, that caused some issues. Uh, <laughs> not bad. Anyway, but I, I can't even begin to, has anyone here been to Haiti? Anyone else? I can't even begin to tell you what that city does to you when you see it. When you leave the airport and you're driving out of that, 
you've never experienced abject poverty. I've been to, I've been to Bogota, and I thought that was poor. This is next level. I, it blew me away, uh, and it blew our kids away. That night, uh, that was a Friday, I think we flew in on Friday. Uh, that night, their church there always has a, they always had a prayer, an all night prayer and praise service every Friday night. They did this, they started about nine o'clock at night. They'd go all night. They would really go till two or three in the morning. And then whoever's there would crash out on the church pews or the floor or whatever, you know, on the cement floor, yeah, hard benches, but they would just, and then about six o'clock they'd get together, they'd have one more prayer and then they'd all leave to go about their day. But they were so full of joy and they were so happy and they were so, and we're sitting, uh, we were in the service for a while, but it's all in Creole. So after a while, it all sounds the same, you know, you don't have any idea what they're saying, anything like that. And they were translating a little bit, but a lot of the kids, we, were, uh, we, were, we had left the service and we were sitting on the roof of the parsonage. Everything's flat roof, cement, and you're really sitting up there to try to catch a little bit of cool air because it's very hot um, and there's no AC because there's no electricity. <laughs> um, so they had a generator running a couple of lights in the church. But I was sitting there and one of the girls who came in said, I, what, what in the world are they so happy about? What is wrong with these people? How can they be so happy? They have nothing. And it was, it was a great opportunity because it was like, that's the joy of the Lord. And the joy of things only makes you miserable. Everything you keep chasing down here, all the stuff that you guys are after, and amen, the end of that is just kind of discontent and misery. That's the real thing right there. That was so impactful. I think most of the kids that went on that uh, trip, if you talk to them today, 20 years later, 21 years later, they would all say, that was a watershed moment in my life. That changed my perception of what's important. Have they all stayed true to the, you know, are they all Gandhi? No, nothing like that. But it gave them a, per, a picture, a perspective of the world. And travel will do that to you, and especially travel on a mission trip. Um, that, it's next year, mention that briefly. Yeah. Yes, uh, I know the church, I was so excited to hear when the, they, they announced about the youth group uh, going to Belize. Um, man, my message to anyone here, any parent or any teenager here, go to Belize. Whether you want to or not, whether you think it's a good idea or not, go to Belize. Whether you think it's safe or not, go to Belize. We serve a big God who's in control. If you want to have a life-changing experience, go to Belize. Invest yourself in someone else. Invest yourself in something bigger than yourself. And invest in yourself in those who don't have. You'll just find out real quick, America is just super blessed. And with that super blessing has come a whole bunch of, good, of, of bad things, too. It's, it's bred this entitlement and lack of gratitude. And, you know, we just, we, it's real easy to complain real fast about the things that aren't just perfect in our lives, right? I'm, I'm talking to me this morning. I'm, I'm the first one to gripe, you know. I want, I want my food right. I want everything right. But the bottom line is we have so much. We don't even know where to begin. And that. Maybe have Renee just share if what you shared yesterday, Renee, about <laughs> coming back to our country and just some of the kind of the culture shock maybe of just some things you shared yesterday. Yeah, so he was asking what was, you know, after being 12 years overseas and then coming back. And I haven't, I have not taught in a classroom here since <laughs> I left Kenya. Um, part of it was because, um, well, the respect factor, the parents in the, down there really um, stressed respect. So it was yes ma'am, no ma'am, and if they did not respond to you that way, you were supposed to correct them until they gave you the proper response. And so to come back here, and there's just this general disrespect ungratefulness, um, it, it's been really hard to see and to 
quite frankly, swallow it sometimes. But um, I think the thing that, you know, I would say, um, the t of course, technology has evolved very rapidly. And so when we were down there, cell phones weren't like the be all end all, you know. Um, so they didn't really have a lot of um, outlets to see what was going around the world or get themselves in trouble. They spent a lot of time with family. And they, these children knew their, their aunts, their great aunts, their uncles, their, I mean like their families were close. They knew their grandmothers, they knew their great grandmothers. And I just feel like that's something up here that is not, I mean, I don't even know cousins are scattered everywhere and I'm some of the end but we don't really we don't ever get together we don't really know them um, so yeah that was a the technology and the unfruitfulness that was, was, that was she, she made the statement technology has taken us away from each other it's it's separated us we we talk about how easy it is to connect to FaceTime to instant message but she and I when you said that I've heard other missionaries say that. I consider you missionaries, by the way. Um, I'm gonna have Dwayne read the quote. It was from Mark Twain. But uh, I just was so moved again yesterday and today because we are, as you said, super blessed. We have everything. And if we don't, we can finance and get everything, which makes it even worse. But, but when you said Haiti and the joy those people some of us have been on mission trips, we could just connect immediately. So I just want us to think about that today. Think about Belize next year. You know, I've had people tell me before, if you go back to Israel, I'm gonna go with you. Well, uh, I'm not going back to Israel. You know, I've been three times, and sometimes I even feel like that's too many times to go. I need to go just one and done. But something like this is just, this is, this is epic. And I know some of y'all have been on mission trips, and, and I hope that resonates with with what you heard today. And when we talk about missions giving and care kits and alabaster offering to build buildings and Easter offering and Thanksgiving offering, this is, this is what that all connects with. And so I'm just grateful the Lord has you in our lives and grateful we just consider you part of our family. So uh, Dwayne came up with this quote from Mark Twain yesterday. If you'd read it and I'll pray for us, okay? Yeah, so I was sharing with him we had some ideas back in the day about what we wanted to accomplish, but couldn't ever put it into words. And just recently, I ran across this quote by Mark Twain, of all people, and it just kind of encapsulated what we were hoping to accomplish. He just said it so much better. And he said that travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness, and many of our people need it sorely on these accounts. Broad, wholesome, charitable views of men and things cannot be acquired by vegetating in one's little corner of the earth all of one's lifetime. And that's, that's a great quote by a guy who lived a long time ago, but it's, I think, even more relevant today. The more connected we get electronically, the more disconnected we get uh, personally. And we can, we can uh, totally lose, and, and, and as Christ followers, this really resonates with me, because we can totally lose the impact we can have on the world because we're so busy listening to what the world's telling us about the world through media. Did, let me repeat that. We can so, <laughs> it sounded like a tongue twister, but I really mean it. We can become disconnected from the world because we spend all of our time consuming what the world's telling us to believe about the world instead of just going out and meeting the world face to face and finding out that those are people that need Jesus just like everyone else is. And, uh, you know, we, we let politics divide us, we let everything in the world divide us, and we should have the love of Christ connecting us. That's my joy every day. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for this moment. I pray that it's something that is etched in the depth of our heart and our mind. Lord, thank you for Dwayne and Renee and their willingness just to go, and sometimes not even seeing the fruit until a long time later. And then those moments where they get to capture it in real time. But, but Lord, help us to hear their heart today. Help us to be challenged by your Holy Spirit moving forward. And Jesus, help us to be as willing 
as we've read about in Blackaby all year long, Lord, as we've studied as a group, as we've, as we've walked through the book, here am I, Lord, send me. And Father, if I'm unable to go physically, here's my money, send it. But whatever it takes, Lord, to see your kingdom in these other places. <coughs> Lord, we're so blessed. But we want to be a blessing for your kingdom in other places. Thank you today. Continue to keep your hand on Dwayne and on Renee. And Lord, as they go back in November, bless them, Lord. And may their ministry produce great fruit. Because we never know, as, as I heard this today, all these connecting points. God's Bible College, Japan, Asia, Guadalajara, it all connected. Thank you, Lord, for your kingdom connecting in that manner. In Jesus' name. Well, let's thank these folks for coming today and sharing. Sure. Thank you guys so much. Did you enjoy that? Amen? Amen. Wow. I just hope that moves your soul. And so if Pastor Dan gets up in the next week or so, he's down in Kids Church today, pinch hitting. If he gets up in a week or so or so and says, hey, we're still working on that trip to Belize, maybe the room will just have hands up everywhere. You don't have to be a teenager to go. You just have to be willing and open and available. Um, also, one more thing. Back in the foyer, I keep forgetting to mention this. We have what we call the prayer wall. And there are these little requests that if you could take one off, you see I put several up there. Take one with you and pray over that request. Or put your own request up and somebody else will take it and pray for it, okay? Uh, that means so much prayer. Prayer is the glue that holds everything together. And then one more thing, um, just prayer requests. You know, I know we've got different ones that are dealing with stuff, and we've prayed for Dave and Cynthia before on behalf of Lydia. Continue to keep Lydia in your prayers. Lydia Combs is their granddaughter. All kinds of physical things they're walking through, tests, doctor's visits, more tests, and her, her, her physical ability is just deteriorating, and she's just a first-year student at Iowa and that she needs our prayers. Let's stand together as we go today. And maybe you want to come to the altar and, and as we're standing with heads bowed and eyes closed and say, Lord, I need to, I just need to listen to you more. I need to respond for you. Maybe this morning you want to come and pray for Lydia at the altar. Maybe you want to come and pray for Joe and Sue Prokos and, and just other needs, Lord. Other needs in your life, maybe you want to come pray for them. Who would just step out and come? Just in the quietness of this moment, just come and pray. Has this message moved your heart today? I hope so. I hope so. We live in a world that tells us how we should think about the world, and we need to be living in the kingdom, which tells us how to think about the world. His kingdom come. We just want to close this service out in a good season of prayer. Jesus, this morning, we've heard from you. We heard from you in the worship. We heard with... From, from you in the offertory and the special music. And we heard from you in the time of dialogue with Dwayne and Renee. And Jesus, help us to go and continue to hear from you today, Lord. We don't want to just listen to those voices that come through on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and all those other platforms. We want to hear from your heart, Lord. And today I believe we've heard from your heart. And Father, as we go today, may we continue. I've already said it, but I'll say it again. May we continue to hear from your heart. And Father, as we go today, may we be reminded to continue to pray for those among us, for our children, for our youth, for our young adults, for our adults, for those that need a touch today, for Lydia Combs, Jesus. We just continue to join our prayers with numerous churches all over the globe that are praying for her today, Jesus and other needs as well, Jesus. Relatives, as we heard in our own Sunday school class that are facing issues of cancer and other physical needs, and Vaughn and Justice, Jesus, who's there at Parker, and, and we just and we think of Mrs. Swift over here as well, and Joe and others, Lord, that are just, they're just kind of in the last stages, the last chapter of life, and we just pray for your peace and your presence in their minds that Jesus, in your time and your fashion, that they would transition in such a way that brings glory to your name and is a testimony to their families, Lord, a testimony to health care workers. But Jesus, again, we come back to this message. Help us to listen. 
Help us to make those adjustments because as Blackaby says, you can't go with God and still be where you are. So Lord, help us to listen. Help us to respond. And Lord, we will give you thanks and praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're dismissed.